colleges and universities. They bring a variety of perspectives, enthusiastic, skeptical, familiar, new, to the discussion of blended learning. So we've invited our panelists to begin with brief remarks about their background and to introduce a critical question for discussion. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. We have Trey Andrea Russworm, the Assistant Professor of English from UMass Amherst. Alicia Ellis, Assistant Professor of German and Comparative Literature from Hampshire College. Rachel Burma, Associate Professor of English Literature at Swarthmore College, and Jen Malkowski, Assistant Professor of Film Studies at Smith College. So please join me in. Mark James, Assistant Professor of English at Malloy College, who has prepared a video for us. Yes. So Mark is on a flight to Rome right now, and so he had to choose between being here in person and being on a flight to Rome, and so we got a video from him. Um, and we actually used this as a way to organize our own thoughts, so I figured I would play it. And I really just said, give us some thoughts or reflections on blending humanities. And so uh, that's where Mark started off for us. And then each of us watched this and came up with some notes. And we're going to try to be as brief as possible so that we can actually talk. 
uh, for most of the time. So we'll play this. It is about 10 minutes, but you'll get the gist of it, and then we'll each probably speak for like five to eight minutes or so, really brief. Um, so we'll play this. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there, uh, but I uh, had a conflict, so. <laughs> Thanks, Trey. Hello, everyone else on the panel, on the panel and in the audience. Um, okay, I'm going to frame this uh, discussion in three vignettes uh, that I'll use to bounce off some ideas um, to my, for my in intervention here. I'll just ask some, uh, some basic questions about uh, blended learning, what, what, what it's going to do here. Uh, the first is a story. Uh, when I first started teaching, the University of Hawaii years ago. Uh, and I had a student who was a major uh, uh, a major in history who planned to be a history teacher. And we started talking about a text, and she said she hadn't read it. Well, why not? And she said it was boring. I said, but it's a history text, aren't you? <laughs> aren't you, uh, aren't you don't you want to know what you're going to be teaching? And she said, oh, I'll get that from the, the textbook and other materials. I don't need to know actually what any of that is. And I bring that up because um, I'm, I'm, uh, there's a, a fear of the extent to which um, teaching becomes a matter of technique uh, rather than control of, 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 of content, uh, rather than any kind of real engagement with content. Um, and one of the concerns that I have is the, the, the extent to which uh, there seems to be a, uh, a desire to um, demote or replace teachers and professors to in making us more adjuncts of the technology. Um, uh, the focus of the class moves away from the professor as a scholar who has been transformed uh, by immerse, you know, immersion in a subject matter uh, to an adjunct to the technology that now contains most of the uh, content. Uh, and the, 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 as a result, the teacher's role becomes one of mostly guiding students to sites or places where the targeted information can be found, more or less uh, uh, uninterpreted by this particular expert. Um, and in fact, m much of the language that I've seen talking about uh, uh, blended learning uh, tends to refer to teachers in other kinds of terms, such as coach, guide, uh, concierge, I've even heard. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, the, the, the way that these, uh, this technology changes uh, requires um, um, the uh, educator to constantly update um, his knowledge uh, or her knowledge of the technology that's that's in place, um, which takes time away from other uh, professional and, and personal <laughs> obligations, um, in, including uh, developing um, uh, more, uh, spending more time uh, recognizing or, or, or engaging in a, in a serious thought of one's, one's expertise. Uh, as, as I suggest uh, just a moment ago, uh, one of the problems or one of the big risks is it risks discouraging students from having any real interest in the subject matter itself. Uh, encourages them to depend on the internet for information that they, that they can go f that where they can find the information uh, to to interact with uh, different kinds of memes or images related to the the, the, the subject, but not necessarily uh, come to any deep understanding of the subject matter. This is a, a danger. Um, a second story is that I was uh, born in Flint, Michigan, and I grew up in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, and I can still remember um, at, during the time of, uh, of deindustrialization, uh, and I can still remember um, how the robots, the mechanizing, the, the, the assembly line, was supposed to make lives easier, or make life easier for the employees working on the assembly line. <laughs> And I can remember press conferences where executives would assure workers that the robots would not end up replacing them because, of course, the worker is irreplaceable. Um, needless to say, uh, we know how that has turned out. <laughs> In 1984, the city of Flint opened Auto World, uh, which was then built as the largest indoor amusement park in the world. And the idea there was to replace the, van the rapidly vanishing uh, industrial jobs um, with jobs in tourism and, and other in, uh, service industries. Uh, as Mike Moore pointed out in his um, uh, first documentary, Roger and Me, uh, one of the uh, um, 
one of the feature attractions was a mock assembly line featuring a mechanical worker sitting on a robotic arm that does the work he presumably used to do, and he sings My Buddy and Me. Or Me and My Buddy, that's what the name of the song was. The, uh, uh, the, needless to say, Flint being out of the way, uh, the rest of the, the United States for the most part located in uh, Michigan, uh, was a colossal failure. Um, it was, and the uh, building itself was called, demolished in 1997. Um, interestingly enough, that site was do donated to the University of Michigan <coughs> in Flint, uh, which has since turned it into a building that houses uh, the School of Nursing and the School of Management, uh, ironically enough. Um, now, before we dismiss the, the fate of the assembly line workers as irrelevant to the kind of work that we do, I uh, invite you to think again about the approach that my student had towards becoming a history teacher, uh, which become, can become more like what we do as professors. Uh, and think, for example, of the uh, pressures we face to standardize curricula, uh, focus on learning objectives, and other um, uh, things that are um, observable and mes measurable. Um, perhaps as we are pressed to put our syllabi materials online, we, there could be more demand that they look more alike, um, standards and practices, whatever. Um, and the uh, another problem is that this gives the impression that knowledge exists out there somewhere and content is uh, fixed prior to class. Um, and the final story, um, I want to just draw a little bit of uh, history here. In the early 20th century, uh, a cake maker in Pittsburgh patented a cake mix that would allow companies to create a market for the excess molasses that had been produced uh, in the country. Um, at first they produced a mix uh, that just needed water, but many consumers expressed a preference for a mix that required a fresh egg or two. Um, this is usually uh, uh, told as a story of, 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 of the human need to participate in the, uh, in, in the batter making, but it was, uh, <laughs> sales dropped after World War II, uh, and it was discovered that, contrary to eggs, that it was frosting that, how, that housewives needed uh, to feel invested and feel again like they were um, participating in the, in the construction of their cakes. Uh, in, by using <coughs> frosting and by layering cakes, um, housewives were able to personalize their cakes through the manipulation of the shapes and designs and the textures, etc. Um, and this move was so successful that now when a person says that he has made the cake himself, or even sometimes uh, made the cake at home, or, or that it's a homemade cake, what he's really referring to is a store-bought mix that he coated with store-bought frosting. <coughs> okay, so I bring this up because like the early cake mixes, blended learning seems to be more <laughs> of a response to the need for technology companies to find new markets for the technology and uh, also for education administrators to find new ways to account for the work that is done in their institutions than it is a response to any real demand uh, from students or teachers. Um, in fact, uh, when I ask my students if they want to engage in some discussions online, they, many of them say they would prefer not to. But there are many that, that would prefer to as well. Um, but there's there's a real question about the extent to which the digital natives um, really uh, want this this kind of um, interaction, this kind of interface. Uh, although it appears that consumers of education have no more interest in education that is completely online than housewives were interested in cakes that are, that only needed water, the question becomes how much face-to-face -face interaction with an actual human is required for educational experience to feel real? How much expertise in any given subject matter will the future educator really need to have in order for it to count as real education? Or to what extent uh, will a, an educator just need to be able to manipulate um, uh, the, 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 the way that people get to information uh, much the same way that uh, the contemporary um, cake artist may be able to do things with um, uh, store-bought frosting and cake. Um, are we looking at a future where educators are as disconnected from the painstaking, painstaking process of actually learning about a subject from someone who has also devoted a great deal of time and energy to thinking about that subject, um, as most of us are disconnected from uh, 
what goes into our cakes. Um, and so uh, and these, these are a, a, a few uh, stories that I wanted to point to as uh, provocations for uh, further discussion. Um, I hope that is something, a nice starting point. Uh, have a great time. Thank you very much for listening. And, uh, take care. <laughs> Up, sit up here. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, so as I said, each of us is going to kind of reflect on um, or share a few thoughts that we had um, after watching this. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I don't think the order is uh, that essential, so we'll just go in order. Sitting. Um, so, I guess for me, I think a lot about blended learning and money. Um, and uh, so, I think about this in a few ways. You know, blending the humanities to me seems to be about money in a few ways, at least. On the one hand, uh, you have increasing pressure, you know, uh, on faculty, on administrators, on everyone, from parents, from politicians about the higher the cost of higher education, right? It's astronomical, and so there are lots of lots of conversation and lots of concern about cost. Um, and I know that in some ways, in some models, and the way some uh, people sort of pitch the idea of blended learning and online education is as essentially a cost-saving measure, right? That eventually there are ways in which we will need less space on campuses, right? As our campus numbers grow, and I'm at a big public university, so uh, space is a premium, right? There's lots of buildings, but there's never enough space. And so there are, there has been a lot of conversation about ways to um, kind of maximize the space that we do have without building more uh, buildings, putting <coughs> more money into that. And so online education and blended learning kind of factor into this kind of cost sharing uh, mechanism. Uh, my thoughts around that, so that's one way I think about money and blending, the blended learning and blending the humanities too. So I guess my, my thought about that is that first of all, humanities is already cheap. Right? We don't have labs, we have low salaries, we are a bargain as far as higher education is concerned. There's a lot of critical conversation, there's a lot of pressure on humanists to kind of change things up, be more economical, but we already are. We're already cost effective as, uh, as our various disciplines. And so that's one thought. But the other thought is that. Uh, because I teach, uh, I'm, I'm a, I teach digital culture and new media classes, and I tend to teach in really technology, technologically rich environments on campus. Um, I know from firsthand experience that investing, doing anything with technology, is never the cheapest route. <laughs> so even as we continue to kind of move in this direction and try to blend our classes and try to increase our use of technology. That's not actually going to save us any money, right? So if you blend the humanities, and part of the concern is cost, cost of higher education, cost of, of, of uh, maintaining humanities is not not notorious for bringing in big grants uh, like the STEM fields. So if you kind of look at it in that way, uh, but one of our ambitions is to increase technology, then we can easily see that that's going to cost more money. Uh, from working in the kind of classrooms that I work in, the hardware after a few years has got to be replaced. I work in uh, team-based learning rooms, TBL rooms with uh, laptops at all the state at all the tables and uh, monitors all around the room. And you know the hardware itself is expensive to replace periodically, but also you end up having to rely on whole new legions of employees to support that infrastructure, to support that hardware. So I'm really not sure that the cost arguments are very persuasive to me. Um, as you know, so that's just something that I think about. Uh, but the other thing is. As far as the humanities is concerned, is and now as my other role as faculty coordinator of Blended Learning Initiative at five colleges, is it is very rewarding to help my colleagues secure grant money. And they're coming from humanities disciplines, right? And so you kind of have this double edge to the money question. Um, one, there's all this pressure to save money, but two, the humanities being kind of chronically underfunded and undervalued in this current moment 
these fields, the blended learning initiatives, um, digital humanities initiatives, have become some of the only ways that my colleagues can get ex money to do exciting things with their teaching. And so I'm kind of you know, receptive to that and aware of that also, that there is an element of strategy here um, in trying to use the funding to do other things, to seem compliant with some of these, uh, you know, not, not just seem compliant, but to kind of go ahead and experiment with some of this because it's a viable resource that people haven't had access to in these disciplines. So I think about that. Um, I was going to say something about digital fatigue being real, uh, but I think Jen is going to talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So one segue that I have, um, related point, is about some of the social ramifications of cre increasing the digital in our lives. And there are a lot of ways to kind of approach this, but as uh, a person of color who's, who's teaching, um, again, new media and digital uh, digital culture classes, I'm very aware of all the research uh, about online harassment and who who's most susceptible to being harassed online, women and people of color. And so in my experience as a teacher, I have never had great experiences with, with students online. You know, that's the, that's the last place I want to interact <laughs> with students because they have weird and disrespectful and completely unpredictable um, and hostile reactions to me in those spaces. And we're talking over email, we're talking online uh, discussion forums, that those platforms and those tools are historically problematic, but especially for people with certain backgrounds, right? And so when we do ask our students to participate in this way in their education, I think we have to be aware that there is a whole bunch of baggage and unanticipated consequences that can come with that. Um, students are not themselves online. We know this from studies on online harassment. We know this from how students have interacted with us probably uh, in certain sp online spaces. And so we also have to be aware of, of who our, our fellow colleagues, but as well as the other students in the class are gonna be most likely to be involved in some vicious kind of hostile situation in an online space. So I think we do need sort of tools and practices and discussion around those particular issues. So um, there are a few other thoughts, especially about how higher education is, in my mind, becoming a lot closer to pre-college, um, secondary and elementary education, and the focus on assessment, and the focus on quantifying, and the focus on sort of justifying and proving that learning is happening. Um, I think there's some uncomfortable parallels there between uh, where we are in college now and the culture and climate around college, especially public education, um, being even more vulnerable to some of this in pre-college education, and so I see some uncomfortable parallels there. But I guess the last thing I will say is, in spite of all that I have just said, I think at times I'm, I'm, I'm curiously critical or curiously skeptical um, about blended learning. And again, as a, as a faculty coordinator, um, I'm interested in seeing what people are actually doing. I'm interested in trying to support people, have these open conversations, raise all of these concerns, and kind of just pile them up. I don't think we can run from these issues. And from the panels that I've seen in the last two days, I don't think people are doing that. I think we're, we're well aware of many of these challenges, but I think we have to centralize these kinds of questions and concerns as a part of our pedagogy, um, even more so. And so I guess that's, that's what I would say. I'm, I'm kind of curiously uh, critical about all of this. Um, I'm Rachel Verma from Swarthmore College, and I think I'll just briefly follow on a couple of things Faye and Jaya just said. Um, I think the first thing that we have to be careful about is that we don't, when we uh, use blended learning techniques or digital humanities techniques um, in humanities classrooms, that we don't devalue humanities teaching as it already is, right? So humanities teaching has a long, rich history of being socially engaged, social in the classroom, project-based, full of active learning, right? Very experimental, right? From like the 19th century, from, from before the 19th century, but my, my expertise is in the history of 19th and 20th century uh, English pedagogy, teaching of English literature. Um, and so while I saw a lot of exciting work people are doing, incorporating digital tools into the classroom, doing online teaching, uh, here and elsewhere recently, uh, I do notice, and I think this is also a funding rhetoric, a lot of language that devalues humanities teaching as it currently is, right? In order to then introduce technology blended learning as a fix. Um, I like to say, and it's not original to me, that 
it may be different in the sciences, but the humanities classroom has already been flipped. <laughs> right? You've heard that. You've heard that before. And I just, uh, I, uh, while I celebrate uh, tech, sort of technology and education in many ways, I just like to flag that because we've done a bad job generally preserving the history of teaching in higher education. We've done a bad job of doing the humanities. We do a bad job of talking about the history in a sort of practice-based way, and I think it's especially insidious in this context. Um, the other thing that I think has come up a lot today in the panels I've seen is the learning management system and how much we're using a learning management system to integrate and coordinate students' interaction with all of these new terms, uh, tools, and techniques that we use when we do blended learning. Um, and I think that no matter what specific content we're teaching when we're using an LMS, we're teaching one lesson always, every day, that the student engages with the LMS, right, which is live in a closed system, right? So some of my students spend almost all of their online time between Facebook and Instagram and Moodle. Mm -hmm. And this is the opposite <laughs> of what I, as a humanist and a digital humanist, want my students to be learning about their use of technology, right? And in a really practical way, as we see that class polarization in the American and North American economy starts to be divided into people who are owning the platforms and people are, who are living in and making data for and working within the platforms, I want my students to be on the right side of that, right? Like that's the super neoliberal way of saying it. You can also give the critique point. Like, I really want my students to understand what they're doing when they're using a tool or living in a closed <coughs> um, And I think that a lot of learning management systems that I see or content management systems that we're using for pedagogy and higher education are unnecessarily closed. Um, I have seen some examples of that even today. Um, so I think that's just my other caveat. Um, and I'll pass it along. I'm Alicia Ellis, I teach German Comparative Literature at Hampshire College. I actually have a, a different perspective about blended learning because I've actually had a wonderful experience with it. Um, and as you said, we've always flipped our classrooms. We've always done these things um, um, in, in terms of using technology and even simple things such as timelines and maps and you know facsimiles of, of letters and, and um, things like that. Um, so I was awarded a grant to blend a course that I that I taught before, writing from the diaspora, reading and reading contemporary women's writing. And one of the things that was really important for me was to engage students as public thinkers. Mm -hmm. And so that many of the tools we used, all of the tools that we used were open access, they were freely available, um, and there was no money involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, I was very careful that I wanted to think about um, reaching, going beyond the print to engage the print once more. Mm -hmm. And so we use things such as Pinterest, Padlet, Wordle, Google Maps, and Prezi in order to actually look at contemporary fiction by women of color. Um, and what I wanted to do was make it student forward and center the student as the kind of creators and the moderators of meaning um, and bringing them to a kind of way of thinking about the material through the tool, but it, but that didn't come first. This text was always centered first, mm -hmm. um, and then the tool came later. If the tool didn't work, we dismissed the tool and we tried something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so the focus of the class was always on close reading, and we used the tool in order to get at different ideas. Um, and so that was really important to me, that we never lost sight of the literature, um, and that we saw the narrative as still as the central part of, the, of, of our work. Um, and one, one thing I wanted to say was, I was thinking about the video that we just heard, and there's this, you know, Bartleby Scrivener kind of reference, you know, I would prefer not to. And so, <laughs> um, and so students at the very beginning of the semester said, you know, I'm not really good with technology, I, I can't do this. And yeah, a lot of them were good at te with technology. I mean, they already had these digital practices in place. They had Tumblrs or Instagram accounts, they were good on Facebook. But when it came to actually thinking about how do I use a Tumblr in terms of thinking about this novel and the analysis that I brought to this novel, how can I make that into a Tumblr? They were like, 
I've never thought of that before, you know. And so I had students making tumblers this semester in a in a class that I blended kind of myself um, without the aid of a, of a grant. So in the fall, when I did this class, I had students who were very reluctant to engage, um, and then I had to kind of cajole them um, into it. And so what was important for me and for students was to feel like they were still learning something, mm -hmm. um, and that I didn't, I didn't reduce any of the kind of rigor of the class. Mm -hmm. It still remained rigorous. Students were still writing. They were writing response papers. They were writing um, papers after we finished the text. But they were also doing wordles. Mm -hmm. You know, they were also using Padlet in order to engage with other students in the class around the text. They were bringing in images. They were bringing in videos. Mm -hmm. um, we did a wonderful, really wonderful Pinterest on uh, Claudia Rankin Citizen an American Lyric, where they <coughs> made 141 pins. Because one of the things we were talking about was how do you use Pinterest in a way that isn't pretty? <laughs> in a way that isn't about curating the lovely, your, you know, your recipes or your jewelry boxes. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to use Citizen, which is a really important text um, that uses multimedia already and, and to ask them to actually bring information about that text to Pinterest and then annotate it. And so I found that that was a really useful tool, but what it did was it, it created student buy-in. They felt much more connected to the literature. And in fact, I think it increased their ability to interpret and to analyze the literature by using things like Padlet and Wordle and Prezi um, and Google Maps. So for example, with Google Maps, I had students um, trace the movement of characters, you know, and it and so since students have sometimes a, a or at least now a kind of um, minimal idea of geography and geographic location, <laughs> this was actually really helpful. They began to see um, where 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 people moved and how they you know crossed the scene, um, and that was really really important. But I wanted to create a culture and a community around student centered learning. But that didn't mean that I disappeared from the text and uh, from the text. That didn't mean that I disappeared from the class at all. Um, and in fact, we actually the students actually did more work in this class. Um, we didn't give up any face-to-face -face time, um, and students were collaborating with each other. I mean, uh, I tried to get them. One thing that didn't work, which was really interesting, I tried to get them to do PDF annotations and markups. And I just were, and I was so excited about this all summer before the class. I thought this is the best thing ever. And of course, they said, "Can we just print out the PDFs and mark them up ourselves?" <laughs> but I thought, if you want to do that, <laughs> um, but and and then the same with Google Doc, uh, Google Drive. I said, you know, you can write this paper collaboratively. And they were like, "Yeah, let's write it collaboratively." I'm like, "Okay, well, let's do use it, you know Google Docs, and you can sit in your own dorm rooms and do it." They were like, no, we just met on Sunday night, had tea, and then did, did it together. And I thought, oh, come on now. <laughs> that, that's that Bartleby moment where the students were like, we would prefer not to. But in the very end, I mean, it's this kind of interesting way of collaboration, but it's also a kind of ethics of collaboration. But they were really responsible to each other. Mm -hmm. And they were responsible for bringing something to the game every single time we met. But also doing the work outside of class and adding the pins and adding the padlets and doing their Google Maps so that other people could look at the Google Map as well. Um, and so this was about ownership of the material. And I felt that even um, after the semester, the students still were putting up pins for Citizen American mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um And that was really wonderful to see. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, this was a class that focused heavily on race, class, gender, sexuality, and nationality. And so it was important that students still came out with that information and still came out knowing, um, being able to interpret and analyze text with a rigor. And so I really placed a heavy emphasis on the rigor of the close reading, of the going over the text, and to not say, well, we're just going to work on this tool. Don't worry about the text. Mm -hmm. Actually, if, if, if that hap you know, if it happened, and we were having a kind of a difficult day working through some really difficult material, we actually focused on the text and got rid of the tool. Mm -hmm. you know? 
Um, and so that's what that's all I wanted to say. Okay, so um, I'm somebody who teaches uh, in film studies, but primarily on digital media. So I'm kind of coming to this conversation from the position of you know, by nature, having a huge number of digital objects in my classes. But I also teach with a lot of technology and do a lot of technologically engaged projects and things in class. But, you know, the, the stance I want to speak from today is more as somebody who, um, you know, through my field, thinks a lot about um, digital and network environments and the kind of consequences of being in those spaces. Um, so in that spirit, uh, the kind of critical question that I wanted to pose for this discussion is, um, do our students want more technology in their education? And I think the assumption is often yes, um, and the answer may be not as much as you think. Um, and uh, to place two caveats on that, uh, I'm not somebody who's about the student as consumer model of corporate education at all. Sometimes we do things our students don't want, and I'm happy they don't want them, and I'm happy to make them do them. <laughs> um, so I'm not just about what students want to do. Um, and the second caveat is I don't want to be uh, you know, the kind of maladjusted jerk who comes to a conference about integrating technology into our teaching with the attitude of, well, maybe we shouldn't, right? So, but if you just in the spirit of this round table to offer a critical perspective, I'm going to do that a little bit. Um, so I want to uh, just give an anecdote to start out with from one of my classes. I teach a class uh, called um, Digital Media and Participatory Culture. And in that class, we do a project, a multi-part project, takes up most of the semester, called Digital Natives, Digital Immigrants, where um, I ask them to do a comparison across generations of digital media use um, using themselves, unless I have I don't know what I'm going to do if someday I have a non-traditionally aged student <laughs> in these classes. I think I'll flip it in that case. Um, but uh, in most cases, using themselves as the digital native and choosing uh, a digital immigrant who will partner with them to kind of study their own media use. And it's always their mom, or 80% of the time. It's <laughs> um, but in any case, so both the digital native and the digital immigrant, to use this parlance, um, uh, uh, do a log of their own media use for the day. And I have students do their log on Twitter, right? So every hour they tweet exactly what media they used in the previous hour, every kind, whether it's like checking a text or listening to music on their way to class or even like watching five minutes of a sports game in a restaurant, all of it, right? So they tweet that every hour. Um, and then later on, they compare it to their digital immigrants uh, media log and do an interview and kind of make a blog about it and all kinds of stuff. But when they do this, uh, there are always a lot of revelations. Um, they re realize, I don't know how many of them before, but I hear all the time, they're like, I have no idea that I'm always using media. Mm -hmm. you know, we all know that from, from watching them, right? Um, but they don't know until they do it. Um, you know, they realize that they check social media with an even more absurd frequency than they thought they did. Um, you know, and they realize that and then this one, this one, you don't laugh about this one, it hits home, right? But they realize that their parents are using just as much media mm -hmm. as they are, mm -hmm. right? Despite sometimes kind of taking this attitude of, you know, kids these days, right? Um, but <laughs> in any case, uh, over the years that I've taught this project, um, and this is, you know, the part that's really relevant to me for this discussion, I've noticed with increasing frequency that a new revelation students have is that their classes, keep them on technology mm -hmm. all day, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, uh, including mine, because I just told you, I made them tweet every hour. A lot of there's been some noise about that, right? Um, but they noticed that, you know, they're digital immigrants, their parents, they looked at their lives and they said, well, they're tied to their computers all day, mm -hmm. and then they come home and they turn on the TV, right? Um, but for them, they're not tied to their laptops all day in class, and then they take out the phone and, and do social media in between and after. Um, so these these kind of uh, patterns are converging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think you know one of the things we were talking about in the last session uh, in the group I was in was that it used to be, as a professor, when you use technology in the classroom, it was this exciting, different, oh my god, now we're going to learn in a new way mm -hmm. kind of moment. Um, and I think increasingly it's going to be uh, the norm and, and that kind of face-to-face, -face, we're just going to talk about this. Um, session is going to be what's um, exciting and different, perhaps. Um, so, you know, what I want to say about all this is that our students are under tremendous social pressure 
to be using digital technology all the time. And I, that's the number one thing I hear when I do these projects every semester from every student, how much pressure there is to stay connected. Um, so I would say that you know, as their professors, we have a choice about whether we keep them plugged in or make them unplugged, right? Um, so will we create a tremendous educational pressure for them to be using digital technology too? And I have the luxury of being able to say this um, with some credibility since I've already proven I'm not a Luddite by teaching on digital media and all this other stuff, right? Um, and I think a whole other topic that maybe we want to talk about is uh, the professional pressure on us as humanities faculty um, to integrate more and more technology into our courses and the kind of rewards we see um, from administration and, and from the people who evaluate us when we do it. So it's hard for us to resist this pressure to pressure our students. Um, you know, I say this as somebody who never unplugs, right? And, and I, but I've chosen that. I've chosen to be a professor of digital media. I choose to use the free time I have to obsessively play Fallout 4 or other video games. Right? Um, you know, that's my choice. Um, and I think, especially for us in the humanities, in the liberal arts, the thing is that our students have not yet signaled that they're making that choice, right? They haven't said, I opt in, I want to live my whole life on screens. I think, if anything, if we, you know, kind of, kind of speculate, the fact that they've chosen uh, liberal arts colleges and the fact that they've chosen the humanities might mean um, they're a little bit less inclined toward that lifestyle than um, some of their peers. And it's really hard for them to admit when they don't want to use technology, right? Because it goes against everything um, they think of about their generation and, and themselves. Um, you know, so those I would prefer not moments of resistance. Can we print this out and write on it instead of you know, annotating a PDF? Those are, I think, hard moments of resistance for them to make um, as a generation. Um, so, you know, I guess uh, what I want to say is it's, it's a really hard thing to do in the contemporary U.S. to get away from technology. Um, so personally, even when my object in the class is technology, I feel good about giving students um, an opportunity and even a mandate um, to make that temporary escape, right, to experience another way of being and thinking in the world. Um, and I think, you know, the value of unplugging doesn't mean uh, we should ignore many of the truly uh, innovative and helpful ways that we use technology in our classes. And like I said, I do this all the time. But rather, if we take um, you know, our responsibilities as educators seriously, when we ask that question, should I teach this particular thing through technology? Um, to me, the bar for answering yes from our position should be high. Right? Um, and frankly, I think it should be higher than a lot of what I see in the digital humanities, despite some of the really good pedagogical practices um, and tools that field has produced. Um, so yeah, can you know, leave it there? Leave time for discussion. So we just want to open the floor for questions, comments, other thoughts. <coughs> it's been a long two days, but <laughs> we're the Grinches who stole Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm back. Uh, so, our first speaker uh, raised the issue of. Myself and, and or, no, 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 or Mark? Sorry, I didn't remember his name. Oh, Mark, yeah. yeah. Um, raised the you know, concerns about what is the role of faculty when you start talking about blended learning. And I thought it was really interesting that he used the phrase we become an adjunct to the technology, which I think also belies the fear of adjunctification, right? Yeah. Like, if these courses are all canned, we don't really need a full-time professor. Um, and I was curious if you guys wanted to sort of think about what are the roles of faculty, and does that or does that not change with the impact of blended learning or technology or digital humanities? I think that's actually really interesting. In my case, everything become is dynamic, so that there is nothing that's canned. Um, and that we have to create each time, with each iteration, we have to create something new. Um, so for me, that didn't feel as if it hit home mm -hmm. in a way, because mm -hmm. students are constantly creating new materials. And I don't know what they're going to create until they come to class mm -hmm. and, I, and we, we look at it on the projector. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel that as an adjunct, I feel like the technology is augmenting 
what we're doing in class with the novels. Mm -hmm. um, the last time I spoke about the class, I mean, I brought in the novels to kind of demonstrate that the novels were front and center. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's just my experience where I'm not using, we're not using these kinds of learning management systems that are very closed. Um, we're using open access materials that are changing all the time, um, and that students are have um, they're accessible to students at all times. Students can still go up and look at their Padlets that they did, or look at their Google Map that they did tracing, you know, the path of someone taking a walk in the dew breaker. Um, so I don't feel that can quality. But that's because I guess I'm doing a different version of blended humanities. I'm not uh, blended learning. I'm not quite sure what my my version of it is, but it definitely feels a little bit different. I don't feel the digital fatigue. I don't think the students did. When they wanted to push back, they pushed back. So you know, no PDF markup. I said, okay, you won't do it. Um, so that's just my. Yeah, I think blended learning is a really good prompt for humanities teachers to have to be a little bit more explicit about <coughs> what it is that we're doing mm -hmm. in the classroom, that it can't just be canned and replicated. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that already. Um, and it's not that we don't know, it's that these knowledges are so implicit, right? The way we make knowledge in a humanities classroom and the way I can teach the same John Dunn poem every semester, mm -hmm. But literally, right, it is not a content transfer thing. I'm not mm -hmm. teaching my students even just a pr sort of canned protocol of how to interpret. We're actually coming to a new collective interpretation every single semester. Sometimes those interpretations are more exciting and better than others. Sometimes they're super ephemeral, right? But, but it's always kind of new. Um, and I think that we all in humanity, I think many of us in hum who are humanities teachers recognize that fact, but I don't think we always have great explicit languages for talking about them in public and to colleagues across disciplines and departments and to administrators. So I think it's a good opportunity actually for us to draw on a knowledge base we already have. Yes? I, I just want to follow up on that because it does resonate with something that I've long felt. that I'm, I am a scientist, but I think a lot of the themes are very similar. Mm -hmm. And, and that is thinking about, Rachel, your comment about a, coming to a new interpretation of, of a work of literature every semester. And in fact, it's not, I would guess, it's not even the interpretation that is the important thing. It was the process of getting there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that I see a lot of the digital revolution as, as putting a really important and valuable challenge to higher education to say, hey, you've always said it's critical thinking. Or put up or shut up because now if it's really you just use that as a guise and it was really all communication of information well you've got a tough competitor out there so now you've got to really come through on this and say it really is about the deep thinking that's going on in there and the sort of transformations that we have about the way people think about what they do <coughs> yeah. I mean I think there are definitely ways that uh, you know, humanities instructors can kind of push back against some of this, even if you use the tools and you say, the tools are part of my process, but it's really the process that we are centralizing in the classroom. I think you can kind of, like if you got the Moodle files from my classes, it wouldn't make any sense, right? You would just have random files. You don't really get a class from that content. Uh, but I guess it also depends on what people, what level of blended or what kind of blended what version of blended learning they're, uh, you know, they're, they're replicating, right? So there might be other people who do, humanities instructors who do have discussion questions, who do have lectures and modules. If you're sort of trying that version of blended learning and you put that content up, I don't think that the instructors would say, that's ready to go, go ahead and, you know, port that, package it, and someone else can teach that class. But if someone other, some other entity wanted to try to do that, um, you might get to the outside world what looks like a very sort of functional, it's not about the process. We have the information here, we have the history of the book in this slide, we have this and that, so we do have content and we do have information. So I guess that, that, that issue about um, process could be lost in translation, depending on who's looking at the content and what they plan to kind of do with it or get from that. Um, so, and becomes a huge challenge to meaningful assessment 
if what we're doing is so much higher level. It also yeah. might be that assessment tools, A, that critical skills are not primarily or only what we're teaching in the humanities classroom, transferable critical skills. Well, I think that's important, important or critical thinking, right? We're teaching students how to have participate in a long, mm -hmm. ongoing conversation mm -hmm. about literature or religion or history. Um, and I'm interested in assessment. I think I'm not phobic about assessment, though it's been heavily suggested at this conference that I should be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> over and over again, and that, that, is, that is a thing that I know. Um, but I'm not sure that the assessment tools or practices exist yet to really get at what I think I'm doing in a humanities classroom, or what I think my colleagues more modestly are doing in a humanities classroom. And I think that's a, a, an exciting project that I keep trying to learn where that conversation is happening. I keep asking, and I keep being given a rubric to look at my essay. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it stands here, it it's online, right? But I know there's exciting, granular, beautiful assessment models out there, just don't have them. I think, I, I mean, I was similarly struck by this in the last session um, when there was a lot of conversation about backwards design. You know, we start mm -hmm. at the end, what do we want them to learn? And then we work back to, you know, what could prove that they learned that, and we work back to what are the uh, learning objectives. I might have gotten that mixed up, but, you know, I was, you know, just kind of sitting there thinking, I was, I was kind of thinking, and I'm really not, like, that appeals to me in, in a big way. But just, uh, you know, I try to put myself outside of my own working habits and say, well, what if we don't know where we're going? Yeah. What if, you know, the kind of point of it is true collaboration with the students, um, you know, and especially when you're teaching a new topic. This is often yeah. true, especially when you're teaching a topic in a, a field that's not really a canonical field, mm -hmm. like teaching in digital media. Um, you know, we, we're working with new texts all the time, and there's not really a you know, kind of can, <coughs> um, you know, of, of the objects we're teaching. So. Um, just the idea that maybe there could be something to be said for uh, kind of not being able to follow that um, outcomes and assessment process if the learning is really created in collaboration in, in a classroom or, or through the blended learning. Like, oh, I think that's well said. Yeah. Jen, I, I think that if you stopped and thought about it for a while, though, you, you would have a sense of what you wanted them to do or to, to be when they got done. I mean, my, my favorite way of thinking about this is to, is to say, what would make me most happy if I could overhear a couple of my former students 10 years from now? What would I like to hear them say? And I teach re recent US history, and it's damn sure not a list of presidents. So, you know, I mean, that, I'm sure there are things in your head that you would treasure if you could overhear that. And to me, that's what we're we're aiming for, and we ought to be thinking about ways that we can assess those kinds of, of pieces. And we, we can't get it 10 years out, but I think we can get at it some in final projects, uh, if we're designing them properly. Uh, and of course, we have good rubrics, and we have lots of conversations with our colleagues, uh, which some of us don't like to do. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, I tend to be probably more structured than I should be. So I was trying to get outside my own head and say, you know, just as a provocation, would there be a way to teach a class where you really didn't know yeah. where you were going that, that might be valuable or superior to um, this other way? But I always know what I want them to say, other than like I want them to like my, my like, shoes. You know? There's also room for the unexpected, though. Like, you know, I get students coming back to me, you know, and they say, this part of the class didn't make sense to me and I didn't think of it in that way and then their answer of like oh now I think about postmodernism in this way and it's not exactly what I would have said I want them to do or to, to kind of you know, be able to capitulate yeah. it's something completely surprising and refreshing and they're jazzed by it and so that's something that you can't measure in a short time frame and that's something that I couldn't have predicted but it's also something that really informed you know who they are in that moment and so they, they got there and so I think that you have to be open to humanities classes having that process with a question mark on some of the paths and say, but, you know, I'm open to this happening and I'd like to see what that looks like. But it can't be measured in the time that we have to assess the course mm -hmm. that semester. It just can't. I think you're, you're naming the metacognitive piece that you want yeah. to have happen, yeah. which to me is ideal. I mean, I don't care about that specific interpretation mm -hmm. that they come up with, but I think you just did what I was hoping. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there are um, schools of thought of involving students in that process of designing a course and asking them, 
what would you like to get out of this course, you know, and how would we know that you got it? And so there, it doesn't, you can still have what are our goals and bring the students in, right, and have that sort of open-ended thing and still be thinking about, okay, goals, if we're gonna get there, what do we need to do to get there kind of thing, you know? So I'm not sure it's as much as dichotomous as, as you, you're thinking, stepping out of your head, you know? Right. Maybe, maybe the question then becomes, how do we build an infrastructure that allows for that collaboration to happen? Because I know for me, like if I set that day one when I actually know who my students are and they're there in the classroom, I'm like, well, what do you guys want to learn? I mean, what's the rest of my yeah, semester? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, yeah. it's madness, yeah. right? Steve? Um, I came here as a real newbie, but probably more on the skeptical side. Mm -hmm. and, but determined to be open-minded and to learn something new. And um, it's really refreshing to hear you sort of say skeptical things about something that you, in many ways, embrace. Um, and, I, and I heard a lot of things that caused me to keep my skepticism. But I saw some things and said, wow, they really did that well. And that I could see how, how valuable that was. Um, and so I was like on the bubble all weekend. How do I feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw our, our speaker today, uh, Roberta, Okay. Frost yeah. and, and and I was really struck by her message, and she, and I thought to myself, okay, let's say it's not any better. Let's say there's no evidence that says this is better. We can do everything in a face-to-face -face classroom, and it's not better. And I thought about her message, and I went, yeah, but that is the world that my students are going to be living in. And if I look at my college mission statement, I have to teach that world. You know, that's what we have to do is prepare people to go out and live in that world and do it well and be good people and good citizens in that world. And so even if it wasn't better, that world is still there that she described. And and I thought, so it's there, you know. And then I thought, but but what I really want to foster, because what she was talking about was the value is collaboration. Well, we already do collaborative learning in a classroom. We're talking about extending it. But we set this dichotomy face to face versus online, mm -hmm. right? Which what we really want is collaboration all over the place, creative, creative collaboration all over the place, mm -hmm. online, face to face. And so the dichotomy seemed to be problematic to me. Um, and it seemed like we've got the wrong name on what we're looking for. I mean, it's just an inside. We've only been doing this for 48 hours. <laughs> One thing I, I would add to that that help, might help, at least it helps me think about this in a, you know, in a, in a what's not a binary of, you know, online and face to face is that maybe part of what we're trying to do is is, uh, you know, build a a flow where things don't end, you know, at at two o'clock when class ends today, that, that things continue on until we meet again next Monday. And so there is this, whatever took place in class today, there's continuity until the next time class meets again. And so it just so happens that, that what takes place during the interim by necessity of you know physical space and time has to take place online and thereby it's blended. But you know, in days of old, when there wasn't the interwebs, you know, I guess we still did blended learning, right? You know, you know, you you were assigned to study groups and you had to go meet with people in your group out, outside of class. So, you know, what's old is new again, and so maybe that's what we're talking about. But it's just a continuity. People still talked about in the early 20th century the extension education movement had this category they called after study, right? So, three years later. They wanted to know what students in their seminars were doing, who they were talking to, whether they had retaught any of the modules of the mm -hmm. courses, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of tracking of outcomes mm -hmm. is also not digital, right? Mm -hmm. It's deeply ingrained into the history of higher ed pedagogy. Yes. Um, I just want to loop back to Andrea, your uh, comments at the beginning about why are we doing this? Uh, trying to pull back and thinking about why. Why now? Why is technology, you know, what are the incentives? It's clearly not saving us any costs because it costs so much. And I'll just offer a theory that I have just coming from my own personal institution, but that technology has become a way of investing in faculty without investing in faculty because no one wants mm -hmm. to do that. Where, so <laughs> investing in, it's true, investing in technology is something that's visible 
it's a form of admissions driven bling mm -hmm. that attracts uh, prospective students like a nice dining hall like um, premier sports facilities mm -hmm. classrooms that are chock full of top of the line top shelf technology become a kind of you know marker to prospective students that this is an institution that cares about learning so the technology becomes the the symbol of learning even though it so and then all this money is invested in technology and then college administrations say we invest a lot in this you better use it right because this is so that becomes instead of reinvesting in faculty and faculty time and um, those kinds of things it it becomes displaced onto the technology so I'm not sure if you've experienced that as well but it's part of a, it seems to me there's a broader uh, kind of labor overview to to this push towards technology now I'm not saying that technology is bad but I'm saying that it has to be understood in that broader context well I mean I definitely think that you know the public conversation about higher education is really central to this too and so it is it is more strategic to invest in the technology, to invest in the tools, than to invest in faculty who are scorned and maligned in public conversations about <laughs> higher education, right? So that it's a risky move to directly invest in, in faculty, uh, whereas technology, you know, kind of brings with it the bells and whistles. And um, yeah, I mean, it's consistent <coughs> with just consumerism, the, the sort of consumer culture kind of at the heart of higher education too, that's there regardless of you know what we think about it. Um, I don't really have much more to add on to that except I see, I see the consistencies. I, I am kind of struck by this, it's the world we live in and I'm kind of thinking about it because when Alicia was talking, I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm for um, a subversive approach. I'm for teaching our students the skills to unnerve and disturb so you've got to like to blow up the matrix you've got to be in the matrix right and that's an analogy that works well you've got to get to know the machine to deal to deal with the machine so I, that makes sense to me i get that i like you know hacktivism uh, subversive practices and helping students explicitly develop uh critical skills that are and digital fluencies that are gonna kind of unnerve things and you know so using Pinterest in a way that isn't you know commonly used or Tumblr in a way that isn't commonly used. I love that inspiration and so I definitely think that that's one way to participate in all of this. Um, and then I still come back to this issue of it's the world we live in and I'm not sure you know how much uh, we individually and as departments you know in the humanities want to push against that. It's the world we live in we have to like, hey you know it's where we are it's where we're going um, you got to get on board in some way. The classrooms are all changing to these high-tech rooms, you know, anyway. Um, the new buildings are consistent with that structure. We have to comply uh, because it's where we are. So I think I can, I can, I can support complying from an activist or hacktivist standpoint to ultimately blow up the matrix if that's where your sensibilities are or disrupt or unnerve it. Uh, but I'm not sure that uh, the other part of just sort of it's where we are you have to kind of go along with this. That that part doesn't sit as well with me. And I think that you know maybe there are explicit ways of saying, look, our department just doesn't want to do this, but here's why. We've tried this. It doesn't work in our cases. It certainly doesn't work in all of the classes in the English department. It certainly wouldn't work with all of the professors in the English department. <clears throat> and here's our rationale for preserving this as a space where the digital is just not supreme, where we're turning off our tablets, where we're turning off everything, and we're reading and we're talking. And I think that it's it's fair to participate in that way too. And I would support I would support that, obviously. I think you know to add to that, speaking of like learning outcomes and what do I want my students to know ten years from now from my class, I think um, you know, a kind of spirit of resistance and the idea that you know, we don't just kind of go along shuffling into the world as it is, but we make the world that we want, right? Um, so for me, as a, a digital media professor, to say to them, hey, you know, it's okay that we're not going to use technology now, and it's okay for you to preserve that space in your life, you know, not just professionally, but in life going forward, uh, is a way to kind of help them make the world they want, even though I'm usually not like Pollyanna about that. <laughs> but I want to believe that. I want to believe that, um, you know, they have an instinct to, to opt out or, or to shut down sometimes that we can 
I encourage that and kind of nurture that in them rather than just saying, well, this is the world you gotta, you gotta go along with. But you're gonna paint your hand in the back. Yeah, the so, front. so to, to tie back onto that, I mean, I think that's what I was calling for this morning is a critical use of technology, right? It's not, it is the world we live in, which means we need to understand how to function in that world, but we also need to understand how to get in it and blow it up. You know, to, to have that critical use, when to have the agency to turn it off sometimes. Yeah. And since and we're being recorded, I just want to clarify when I say blow up the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> I only have tenure as of like a month ago. Yeah. That's, that's a metaphor. We speak in metaphors. <laughs> but I mean, I think the idea is that we want to build that agency in our students so they know when to make those decisions. And I think one thing we have to be very careful of as faculty is these technology. I mean, I. Austin is a tech entrepreneur hotbed, mm -hmm. and you know, I get, I don't know if you get any of this, I get like calls and emails yes. from some new company, and we yes. have solved the problems yes. of yeah. virus. Yes. And they, <laughs> let me tell you, yes. I know how to make your lectures more engaging. Yes. And I said, we don't have large classes and huge lectures yes. to make more engaging. We have small class size. We already solved the engagement problem, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and if you're solving the wrong problem, and where there are tools that can teach our students critical reading, or you know, tools to help them dig deeper into things, you right. know, solve that problem. Help them figure out how to solve unstructured problems. <laughs> they haven't figured out that one yet. But I think a lot of times <laughs> you have these tech companies that are solving the wrong problem, and if we're not in there engaging and being critical of it and being explicit about what our practices are and where we use something where we don't, then yes, we're going to have that pushed on us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always use the Microsoft Word example, right? Because it's yeah. so widespread and it's such a terrible technology and it informs <laughs> so much of what you can do and not do, right? And I think like that's a one good use of humanities critique. Like you can literally unbundle it, look at it, and teach them something different in a way that's really going to, yeah. <coughs> so here in the front, yes. Um, how, how much of this discussion is specific to the small liberal art college environment and the particular mm -hmm. student population? And, and I'm saying this mostly because I taught an online class last year for the first time, and for the first time I met the adult, full-time working population mm -hmm. in my graduate institution who had been almost invisible to me before them. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean if, if certain populations of students are getting trapped in the matrix to use your... Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Can I actually add this, say something a little bit different? I mean, I um, one of the things that's really important for me as a literature professor is that I bring students to a discourse and that they begin to understand how to speak about literature and how to make meaning um, and how to talk, for example, specifically about this course, how to talk about exile, how to talk about mm -hmm. diaspora, how to talk about gender, race, class, colonialism. Um, and so that isn't tool dependent mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. It's about what we do in the classroom. And it's about how um, the tool may enable students to kind of think a little bit more critically um, about the material. So for me, it's not as if students need to unplug or plug in, but it's about when and how they choose to do it, and when and how I, I choose to ask them to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but that our, our books are dog-eared, our, our novels are, are underlined heavily, um, and that I don't, I don't feel as if, um, you know, that I have to make this clear-cut kind of decision about whether or not to use technology in the classroom. I feel like it's always an ongoing negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, and that when we want to pull back or when students are saying, well, you know, this isn't for us right now, then that works, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that we go back to the text and we, and we put Evernote away or we put, you know, Google Drive away or something like that. Um, and so for me, it's not as if I, I feel the pressure. I don't feel this kind of pressure from my institution to be connected and to be, you know, technologically kind of bound. I actually feel that um, it's something that people are like, oh, well, that's really neat. Um, Especially when students in my class kind of um, take something, take a tool that we've used to analyze a text and bring it to another class mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. That's really rewarding mm -hmm. um, because it shows that they're, they've 
actually gained a level of competency about a tool mm -hmm. and have and have actually gained a level of competency about the literature that they were using mm -hmm. in order to engage that tool um, and bring the ideas out. Um, so for me, I don't feel as if you know you have to be in the matrix to blow up the matrix, but rather that you know you can you can work with you can work with existing technology, but you don't have to make it kind of determine the class. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I can answer Beth's question. I mean, I, I'd like to hear Beth answer this question, actually, because you're the one who has experience teaching this course, and I don't know if some of us, maybe not all of us, have taught fully online courses where we don't get choosy choices and have resources to think about when we're going to be online and when we're going to be offline. It's like a Moodle site and some videos and when the instructor is chatting with the students and it's already determined, right? And we talked about, so I think in liberal arts context, so A, it's about maybe funding, less than it is about liberal arts versus university. But I think when the decision's been made ahead of time, I think it's a different situation. And so I'd be curious to hear what your I, I mean, I think that there's, this, that there's this tension here and that we, we're, we're very skeptical of these tools and yet we love the access that they bring. And I had taught students who would not have been either very comfortable, I mean, I had disabled students who, who had difficulty just mm -hmm. sort of speaking and, and had a lot of, who I've taught like in person, and they had a lot of trouble interacting, but writing they were much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I've taught students who had, who were working nine to five schedules and it was very difficult for them to, to come into campus. Mm -hmm. um, but my concern is that if we, all of the, I think all of these objections hold that it is much harder to build community, that it's much harder to facilitate critical thinking in a way. And I'm just concerned that as, as much as we already have a system where the small liberal arts college gives this much, in some ways, much richer educational experience than you can get from a large university, that that as we move in more and more online, it's just going to, they're, they're just going to push even further and further apart. You're not even going to get into the sort of online model of education for the masses and then the elite. I think that polarization is a thing. I think that's mm -hmm. why. But I think people like Mellon are funding more cross-institutional stuff. <coughs> so I think that there is a consciousness among funders, at least, that mm -hmm. that, polar, that higher ed polarization is following class polarization and that there are some sad small things. <laughs> also with the, the idea, I don't know, um, it was interesting, the idea that the focus is funding the technology, because actually what I heard again and again right. was, we have no money for technology, we have exactly. these great tools. <laughs> that really the funding, yeah. and this is maybe the funding that the five colleges has, it's for faculty using technology, mm -hmm. right? It's mostly faculty stipends mm -hmm. or students who are helping them or um, things like that, bringing guest speakers. You know, it's more about human capital than it has been about actual hardware. I don't exactly. yeah. Well, it, yeah. it works in two ways. Like that particular yeah. pool of funding is for that, but from the institutional side, a lot of the funding that I've seen is for the hardware, for the infrastructure, and then there are uh, foundations like Mellon and Tigo that are funding faculty to do the things. And so I think depending on where the stream of funds is coming from, mm -hmm. it certainly kind of affects the sort of care or tone of mm -hmm. how you use technology and, mm -hmm. and who's the focal right. point of right. those resources. But I would say since we're running out of time that I think we're, we're, we're the, I think the conference is basically over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that going forward, my, my one wish is just to continue to centralize these critical conversations and concerns in your pedagogy, in your digital you know, pedagogies and approaches to online education and blended learning. And uh, don't shy away from asking the, the difficult questions, um, regardless of who's funding the project. Right? Like that's something that we can push against constantly and still evolve and, and use some of these tools. But I think it's going to be a richer, more truthful, rewarding experience if we're able to do this. In the interest of not investing too much in infrastructure, uh -huh. <laughs> getting, getting to put them back here, we'll use them next year. <laughs> <laughs>